today's verses, Proverbs 30, 24 to 28. There are four things on earth that are small, but unusually wise. Ants, they aren't strong, but they store up food all summer. Hyrexes, they aren't powerful, but they make their homes among the rocks. Locusts, they have no king, but they march in formation. Blizzards, they are easy to catch, but they are found even in kings' palaces. May we be blessed by the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Kind of an odd passage of scripture today. Where should I point this? Who needs the word of the Lord the worst? I'll point on you. Okay. 45 years ago today, a couple of amazing things happened. One you probably heard about. A man walked on the moon for the first time 45 years ago today. How many of you were alive when that happened? Okay, like five. <laughs> well, let, let me tell you, it was a big deal, okay? It was really a big deal. And I got to see it. I got to see Neil Armstrong step off the, the uh, lunar lander and walk on the moon and say a small step for a man and a giant leap for mankind and all of that. And it was all very exciting. But the second thing that happened that day happened to me, and you probably didn't hear about that. Um, I like playing pinball. I don't know, are you familiar with pinball machines? People don't use them very much these days. But that was art, that was game technology back then. And you couldn't have them in your home unless you were very wealthy, but you could go different places and play pinball machines in arcades. Well, I lived in a very small town and there was no such thing as an arcade in our town, but they had them at the bowling alley, okay? So, I would play pinball machines. Now, pinball machine was 10 cents a game, which is about 100 won, or you could play three games for 25 cents. And that was a really big deal, that was a big deal. And if you had a quarter, you could play three games, and if you were good at pinball, you could make that quarter last a long time. Why am I saying all of that? because these two things really go together. On July 20th, 1969, when Neil Armstrong was walking on the moon, I was playing a pinball game in the bowling alley, and I took time out to watch him walk on the moon while I was at the bowling alley. We were a very poor family. We didn't have very much money. And to play pinball take, took a little bit of money, not very much, but it still was some. And I wanted to go play pinball games with some friends and didn't have any money. I was 13 years old, just turned 13 years old, a brand new teenager, trying to be cool, but I didn't have any money. And um, so I asked my mother, Mom, do you have any money that I could use to go play pinball at the bowling alley? And she said, I don't know, I'll go look. And a few minutes later, she came back with not just one quarter, but six quarters. In, in between her fingers. And she said, here, you can have it. Now these were probably quarters that she got out of my dad's clothes or something like that when, he was, when she was doing a wash or something like that. But I have to tell you, it doesn't sound like much. That was an amazing gift my mother gave me that day. That was something very, very special. So at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I went down to the, to the bowling alley and I played pinball all day until 10 o'clock when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I would have had to have watched it at home, but I got to watch it with some friends at, at the bowling alley because of that special gift my mom gave me on July 20th, 1969. Amazing thing happened that day. Great things come in small packages statement is, is proven true throughout the whole Bible. 
Abraham was a lonely 90-year-old pilgrim. And, uh, Moses was an orphan slave child. Uh, shepherd boy David, he was a small kid. God's word teaches us that the greatest truths come from the smallest of people and the smallest of events. Jesus was even born in a small way. The people chosen to carry on his mission would still be considered small people today, fishermen, tax collectors, all kinds of uh, different backgrounds. But God has a way of putting enormous value into something small. Always remember, no matter how big you get in life, when you were conceived, biologists say that you were no, no bigger than just a grain of sand. Our scriptures today opens in Proverbs chapter uh, 30, verse 20 through 48, uh, 38, uh, 28, 24 through 28. Four things are on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. The, uh, the value of something doesn't always, uh, doesn't always depend on its size, does it? There's a, a pink diamond. Uh, I think I have a picture of it here, perhaps. Um, do I have that picture, Jeremy, of a pink diamond? Oh, well, that looks something like a diamond, but I was looking for the, for the pink diamond. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's... Uh, uh, that is a, uh, uh, the most valuable diamond in the world. It's a pink diamond. It's called the Pink Star, and it's worth 60 billion won. So that's pretty nice, pretty nice uh, uh, rock. You can see how little it is in comparison to another big rock that I'm familiar with. There's a picture of... <laughs> yeah, that, that's a little bigger rock. More people get to see that than see the pink star. There are four things that we're look at today that are very small and insignificant, yet we can learn tremendous truth from them. Jesus started with 12 men, and even after the resurrection, the church was only 120 people. There weren't many people in the original church than, than are here today, for the most part. There's probably a little fewer than that. Historians tell us that that at the time, uh, uh, the population of Palestine was about 4 million people. There was 120 Christians on the day of Pentecost. So that meant that one out of every 30,000 pe 30, people, one out of every 30,000 people was a Christian on the day of Pentecost. That would be the equivalent of having just 1,650 believers in all of Korea, or uh, just more than 20 Christians in the whole city of Chonam. Yet consider what a great work was started by those 120 followers on the day of Pentecost and beyond. There's over a billion Christians today in the world. So from one out of 30,000 to one out of about seven in the world are Christians. Great things come in small packages. The verses that we uh, are studying today come from uh, chapter 30 of Proverbs and they are written by Augur, the son of Jacob. And he lived about the same time as King Solomon. And he was considered wise enough to have his Proverbs put in the, in the book of Proverbs. In this text, he lists four things on earth that are very small. Yet despite their size, they are wise. And when we study them, we can find out the four great characteristics of living for the king. Four great characteristics of living for Jesus. First is the ant. Now we can have the ant. Now the ant's a pretty impressive creature, actually. Look at those legs and, and the, the jaws and all of that. But they're pretty small. They're very small. Compared to the world around him, the ant is not strong. Scripture says he's not strong. We know that he can lift 850 times his weight, but his weight is very small. But he is wise because he plans ahead. We uh, understand that the, the ant brain has about 250,000 cells. A human brain uh, has 10,000 million of these cells. So a colony of 40,000 ants 
has about as many brain cells as a human being. But what that ant does with that little brain, we can learn from. It, pre it prepares for harder days ahead. It re uh, prepares for harder seasons. And the ant knows that just because it's summer right now doesn't mean that winter isn't coming. For the ant, it's all about looking forward and storing and thinking and acting. I certainly understand that we should live in the moment. However, to live in the moment, we have to live in a lot of different moments every day. And every one of those moments has decisions in them. Sometimes it's like walking through a minefield trying to figure out the right thing to do. However, if we are letting God lead the way, that way is going to be a lot safer. And we need to understand that we all have a future. Our spiritual storehouse can be full to overflowing when we live for the Lord and not for the world. And so we should change our attitude, adjust our thinking, and put things in place for the future. We must be prepared. Well, what things should we prepare for? John 16, 33 says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. The world is full of temptations and sorrows and trials. But be just be simply aware that Jesus has overcome the world. All of those things you can have victory over. Um... We also have temptations and trials. Uh, also, we should also prepare uh, for the second coming of Jesus. Prepare your minds, Peter says, for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the grace of salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed, revealed to the world. And we should also be prepared to tell other people about Jesus. Peter says again, your worship uh, you must worship Christ as Lord in your life, and if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. God is all about right now. He, he is not I was or I will be. He is the present tense God. He is I am. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in a time of trouble. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't plan ahead. Here's another thing, a couple of things that are interesting about ants that I, I found out. They always work with what they're given. It reminds me of uh, Joseph in the, in the book of Genesis. Joseph seemed like he was always second in command. He never had charge of anything, really. Second to his father, second to Potiphar, second to the prison warden, and finally second to Pharaoh himself, but second. He distinguished himself in every position, but it didn't seem to matter to him that he wasn't in ultimate control. Today is just a training ground for tomorrow. We learn What we learn today will be of great value tomorrow. It may seem like you're in an obscure place, but your time is coming. You may be in a, a, a desert season in your life even. But the Pharaoh's palace is just down the road. The second thing about ants is they don't wear out very easily. And I've never seen an ant that had an agenda. He always has a place to go and something to do. Paul says in Galatians 6 9, do not let, do not get, uh, let us get tired of doing what is good. And at just the right time, we will re reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. However, you're not supposed to burn yourself out either. Ants don't do that either. Don't let yourself wear out in the kingdom. You are preparing yourself for a great reward from Christ, when Christ does come. Also, ants don't waste their time complaining. They really don't. When you knock down their anthills, they don't sit around and cry about it. They send out a bunch to come attack you <laughs> and drive you away, and they go and rebuild their house. They just keep at it. One thing Christians must learn is to not give up, not complain, and just keep at it. 
The next animal is the hyrax. Isn't he cute, huh? Looks a little bit like a rabbit with short ears. And they live in Israel. What's a hyrax? It's a small gray rabbit-like creature. It lives among the rocks and burrows into them when a predator comes looking for them. In order for a predator to get one of these little guys, you need to knock down a mountain of rocks. Hyrax isn't powerful, but it's wise enough to know where it needs to be to be safe. It goes to the rock. Hyrax are cute and cuddly and soft, and that's what makes them attractive to, uh, to animals that want to eat them. But they are also but it, it's also their greatest weakness. They, uh, and that tells me that your biggest, your best attribute can also be your biggest liability. You can talk, but your mouth might get you in trouble. You can remember things, but you can't shake the past. You are outgoing, but you tend to get hurt a lot. We are sometimes weakest at our strongest points. The hyrax is aware of its own weaknesses, and it, it depends on the, on the rocks. It realizes that it must depend on something greater than itself for its safety and security. It goes to the rock. So the lesson I see here is that we need to be aware of our weaknesses and our strengths. For instance, what sin troubles you most often? What things get you sidetracked the most often? What things bother you the most? The hyrax isn't ashamed of the fact that it needs to run to the rock to be, be safe. He needs a power greater than himself, just like we do. One of the main temptations for people uh, of God is to say, I can do it alone. You can't. You can't do it alone. You need God. Psalm 62 says, uh, He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Do you have a hiding place in God? What do you do when the enemy is after you? Do you try to do it alone? Do you try to fight Satan by yourself? If you do, you will probably fail. The Hyrax also always has an escape route. Whenever I stay in a motel, then one of the first things I do is to look for an escape route in case of a fire. Debbie probably doesn't even notice that, but I do do that. You have to have a way out, an evacuation, an evacuation route. Spiritual life is the same. What's your place of escape? Do you try to escape through drinking or through drugs? TV or friends or pornography? Or did you escape through God through prayer? To God through prayer? There's only one of those things that will really help. Matthew 6.6 6 says, when you, go, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The next creature is the locust. Oh, look at that. Hey, uh, yeah. Locust doesn't have a king, scripture says, but they know their strength is in numbers. Locust swarms can vary from one kilometer in size to hundreds of kilometers in size. A large swarm can eat up to 100,000 kilograms of plants in one day. Um, locusts, uh, locusts were one, uh, one of the plagues, plagues of Egypt in, in Exodus, and consider what was damaged, uh, the damage that was done by just that one small creature multiplied by that many. And they cooperate with each other. It's an amazing thing. It's my feeling that if an insect that is bent on destruction 
can operate cooperative in this world, then the church should be able to operate uh, cooperatively too. After all, we have a king and we have his instructions. There's no need to fight for position. They don't fight for position, they just find a piece of something to eat and eat it. There's, for instance, there's maybe some people who want attention or they want the microphone or the stage or or whatever. The kingdom of God is not for people who are looking to promote their own agenda. The kingdom of God is for those who are promoting God's agenda, not the agenda of man. Remember, Jesus gathered 12 people, not one. And, and you can also look at the diversity of the early church. Peter preached the first sermon. James pastored the first church. Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles. John received the revelation of the end times. Stephen was the first to die a Christian martyr's death. One person didn't do it all. One person couldn't do it all. God wants us all to work together for his glory because cooperation is so much better than competition. A plague of locusts can destroy crops, and I can tell you a plague of Christians can destroy a lot of things too. But a group of Christians who are cooperating with one another can change the world for the better. Is your mission about cooperation or is it about competition? Remember, we all have gifts. They're all different. There are different kinds of service, but God works in everyone so that his will can be done. The so last animal is the lizard. This animal is a water monitor. And he's the second largest lizard in the world, can be. Um, when I was stationed in Thailand in the 1970s, I got a real education about lizards. They were everywhere. So when, when scripture says that they're easily caught and found even in the king's palace, I know what he was talking about because they were everywhere. They were in your house, in the ceilings, the floors, the walls, everywhere. And there was a neighborhood cat that would come to our door when they, this cat would see us come home and wait for us at the door. And when we unlocked the door, the cat would rush in and catch a lizard. There was, <laughs> there was always a lizard on the wall or someplace, and it'd come running out with a lizard in its mouth. That's usually a small lizard, but it worked every time. Now this guy, this water monitor, can be up to 75 centimeters long, even bigger. Cat didn't catch this one. <laughs> I found one of those in my bathroom one time, and he was, he was probably maybe, well, long, he was long, and I let him have the bathroom, <laughs> wasn't going to argue with him, but mostly lizards are, these lizards that, that the proverb writer was talking about was small type lizards. They're easy to catch and they're small, insignificant. But they're wise because they don't let sh their shortcomings bring self-doubt. Even though it can be caught by the hand, it still finds its ways into the greatest places in the earth. Some more interesting facts about lizards. Some species are able to disconnect their tails and the tail continues to move after separation and it confuses the, the uh, predator and the tail grows back. In other words, it's willing to let go of something so that might have been considered important. Some of us need to learn to let go in order to have new growth too. Someone has once said that Christian maturity is, the, is mastering the art of letting things go. Another thing about lizards that are interesting is that's interesting is lizards never stop growing. And when they outgrow their skin, they shed it off. The wizard, wizard, <laughs> the lizard is willing to cut its losses in order to move on to the next stage of life. They are you 
hanging on to a bad relationship, a bad job, a bad attitude that needs to be cut off, let God do some surgery on you. If you never get rid of the junk in your life, that junk will consume you. God has great things in store for each of you. His plans have nothing to do with your wisdom or your ability. His plans do not always depend on your giftedness either. Moses said, I can't speak well, for instance. And God said, who made your mouth? You've got to have aspirations. Like the lizard, willing to go anywhere. Great men and women have become great because they believed they could be through God. If you believe in God, then the next step, the next question is, do you believe in yourself? God believes in you. Jesus said, I have chosen and appointed you. We are created to produce. God said, be fruitful and multiply. We are ambassadors for Christ. Uh, Peter said also that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's an English missionary uh, by the name of Helen Rosevere. She tells a story about an incident she experienced during her time in Zaire, in Africa. One night she had worked hard to help a mother in the labor ward, but in spite of all they could do, the mother died, leaving them with a tiny premature baby and a crying two-year-old daughter. There was no incubators or even any electricity. So they used a hot water bottle to keep the babies warm during the cold, windy nights. One of the nurses filled the hot water bottle and it burst due to, to dry rot. It was, their only, it was their only hot water bottle. They wrapped the baby in a blanket and slept with it by the fire. The baby made it through the night and in the morning, Helen gathered the other children to pray as she did each day. She explained the situation about the two-year-old girl who was crying because her mother had died and her infant sister and how the baby would probably die the next night without a hot water bottle. So during the prayer time, one 10-year-old girl, Ruth, prayed with the usual bluntness of children who don't know any better. She said, please God, send us a water bottle. It will do no good tomorrow. God, as the baby will be dead. So please send it this afternoon. And while you're at it, would you please send a dolly for the little girl so she knows that you love her? Well, the missionary Helen, she was kind of in a tight spot. She knew that God could do everything, but there's limits, right? The only way that God could answer that particular prayer would be by sending her a package from back home in England. And in the four years that she'd been in Africa, she'd never received a package from home. Anyway, if someone did send a package, who would put in a hot water bottle? They lived on the equator. Later that afternoon, car came by and left a box at Helen's front door and when Helen got home she saw it and gathered the children around. They opened the box and Helen began pulling out brightly colored, colored clothing for the children as well as bandages for the leprosy patients and she put in her hand and pulled out a brand new rubber hot water bottle. Well she began to cry and she hadn't asked she hadn't asked God to send it because she didn't really believe he could. But Ruth, that little 10-year-old girl, did believe. She was in the front row of the children and rushed forward. Well, if God had sent the bottle, he must have sent the dolly too. So she went through the box and rummaging finally at the bottom of the box, she pulled out a beautiful, nicely dressed dolly. She didn't doubt, not for a minute. And uh, the little girl said, can I go over with you, Mommy, and give this dolly to that little girl uh, so she'll know that Jesus really loves her? 
That package had been on its way to Africa for five months. Packed up by Helen's former Sunday school class, whose leader had uh, heard and obeyed God's prompting to send a hot water bottle to the equator. And one of the girls had put in a doll for an African child five months before in answer to the believing prayer of a 10-year-old who would uh, bring it that afternoon. Here's a prayer from Scripture, a word from Scripture. Isaiah 65, verse 24 says, Before they call, I will answer Doctrinally, that is a perfect example of God's provenient grace. I just thought I'd really throw that out at you. Great things come in small packages. Remember, your gifts are important no matter where they go or how you use them for the glory of God. But your faith is more important. God's grace and plan are in place. His creatures are like, like the ant, the, the hyrax, the locust, and the lizard. They don't have no doubt, any doubt, as to their purposes. They live it every day, and so should we. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that your, your gifts go beyond measure sometimes. And we ask that you just take this time, Father, bless us as we go from here. And we ask that you uh, grant us your peace and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.